If you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to the book of Hebrews. The Lord has been uh, dealing with me on a certain subject. And out of all that's happened already this morning, I still believe there's more. So I want to have, um, I want to treat to you a little bit out, out of my heart and have, have, have a special moment of prayer at the end because I believe that what I have to say to you today is uh, very important. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12 says, For the word of God is living and active. Before we go any further, I don't know if they're watching, but our, uh, um, uh, Pastor Colton already alluded to our pastor and the team being gone. Can we just honor our pastor this morning? Tell him that we love him and we miss him. We love you, Pastor. Thank you for being our shepherd, our leader. We honor you and thank you for being my daddy. Love you and for allowing me to preach in your absence. Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Elbow your neighbor, tell him the word is alive. And both joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And quickly, if you'll turn to the book of Amos, it's somewhere in the middle section. If you see Genesis, you've gone too far. And if you see Revelation, you've gone too far in the other direction. The book of Amos, chapter number 7, beginning in verse number 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all his words. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will, in, will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, and flee away to the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and there, everyone say there, there do your prophesying. But no longer prophesy at Bethel. For it is the for it is a sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. Then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. For I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. I don't like that word figs. It just doesn't roll off the tongue easily. I'm a herdsman, so he's a shepherd. He works with sheep, and he's a grower of sycamore trees. But the Lord took me. Everyone say, the Lord took me. The Lord took me from, from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now hear the word of the Lord. You are saying you shall not prophesy against Israel nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore, says the Lord, your wife will become a harlot in the city, my God, and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword, and your land will be parceled up by a measuring line, and you yourself will die upon unclean soil. But moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Now, I want you to find your best-looking neighbor because what I have to say and what I'm going to ask you to say is controversial, all right? If you're, if you're next to your spouse, please choose your spouse as your neighbor. So look at your best-looking neighbor and say, Neighbor, I know what the Bible says. I know we're supposed to have peace with all men. I know we're supposed to be in unity. I know all those happy scriptures. But I prophesy to you today 
you are called for conflict. I want to preach to you. Can you let me preach to you? Don't look at me with that tone of voice. I promise I'm going somewhere. You're, say, you're called to conflict. Let's do some work. Amen. Amen. When you get saved, when you have a salvation experience, how many of you, if, if I asked you, you'd wave your hand and say, I'm saved? Well, don't all raise your hand at once. If you're not saved, you can get saved today. Amen. Now, how many of you are old school? You'd say, I'm saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and fire baptized. All the saved, saved folks. See, they're saved. See, in, 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 in today's world, they're saved, and then they're saved, saved. I don't have time for that, but there, there, there's only one saved. Either you're saved or you're not saved. When you have an encounter with God and he saves you, salvation is a spiritual aspect. Everyone say spiritual. You can't see salvation. There, it's, it's, it's not a transaction that shows up on your, on, 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 on your credit score of heaven. There's no, there's no physical evidence that you've been saved. That's why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 says, For you have been saved by grace through faith. Everyone say spiritual. Salvation is a spiritual transaction where the spirit of God becomes one with your human spirit. All right? Are you tracking with me? But you still have a body and you still have a soul. And when you get saved, you forfeit the control of your life over to God. And his spirit comes to live and to join and to be connected to, to be one with your human spirit. And that comes through the baptism and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Um, I'm sure that our pastor would agree, but we don't teach nor agree with the sinner's prayer. Because a prayer has never saved anybody. We call it a prayer of Thank you. We call it a prayer of repentance. And if, if you weren't here on Tuesday night, this past Tuesday, I encourage you to find someone who was and ask them for your notes because Pastor did a tremendous, tremendous Bible study on the importance and the necessity of repentance. You cannot be saved without repentance. And after repentance, we see this in the book of Acts, chapter number two, after repentance is what we call immersion in water, baptism. We are quite literally baptized into the name of Jesus because there is no authority without taking on his name. Because while he is a father to the fatherless, while he is the son of righteousness, while he told his disciples in John 14, I'm with you now, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit to live in you. He is all of those things, but none of those things carry the authority that his name carries. And once we have been baptized into his death, as Romans says, raised to walk in newness of life, it is a promise unto us, Acts chapter 2 and verse 39, and the promise is unto you and to your children's children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. The Holy Spirit is a promise exclusive for the believer, but it's not a gift you have to work for. It's just what you receive by faith. And so at salvation, at the infilling of the Holy Ghost, when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, there is a spiritual transaction that takes place. And the spirit you once had no longer exists because God has invaded your spirit and he has now been made one with your spirit and your spirit and God's spirit is now synonymous. Are you tracking with me? This is making sense. 
Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. In verse 16, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So it is the spirit of God that affirms you and I as a child of God. All right? There's a spiritual transaction that takes place. But you still have a body to deal with. That's why you still get headaches. That's why you still get sick. That's why you have an immune system that needs to be strengthened. I don't subscribe to the theology that if you're sick, it means you have a demon. No, sometimes I just have a flipping headache. <laughs> you have to forgive me. Last, last weekend I was in Texas with Apostle Brent Douglas from New Zealand and uh, Prophet Jacob Biswell. And uh, Apostle Brent Douglas uses the word all the time, flipping, because it's just their culture. Uh, and it, it's just what he says, I guess. And so it... it, it it kind of rubbed off on me, so I'll, I'll try not to say that. But when you get saved, it's a spiritual encounter, but you're still left to pick up the pieces of a broken body and a broken soul. And so, yes, you're saved, but you still need the act of sanctification. You still need the Holy Spirit to work in and through you in a process that if you'll, if, you, if, if you'll work with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will then start to change the things about your soul that you don't like. He'll start to change the things about your body that you don't like. Nobody had to tell me I should stop smoking weed. When I got saved, I didn't want to do it anymore. Nobody had to tell me I should stop fornicating. When I got saved, I didn't want to do it anymore. Nobody should have to tell. Come, come on, help me preach. Is, is this church alive this morning? Nobody should have to. See, 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 that's why we don't swing a big hammer from the pulpit telling you what you can and can't do. Because it's the job of the Holy Spirit to convict you. See, the church has adopted this, this demonic mindset that anything that convicts me, I'm now offended by. And we have associated godly conviction with, 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 with satanic condemnation. And so when you come into the presence of God and you start to tremble at, at the awesomeness of his power and you start to feel this guilty remorse for the things in your life that are not good, that's not the devil attacking you. That's God drawing you out of sin. Romans says it's the goodness of God that draws men unto repentance. So you've got to be able to discern this is not Satan condemning me. This is God convicting me. And conviction is a holy thing. Conviction is a godly thing. So Romans 8, 16, we are, his spirit joins together with our spirit. So now my, the spirit that lives in me, the, the Holy Spirit comes and kicks my spirit out. And now his spirit lives in me. But I still have a body. Everybody say body. But I still have a soul. And your mind is not connected to your spirit. Your mind is connected to your soul. That's why you can still prophesy because being, being prophetic is a gift but still have a perverted mind. Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That means when God gives you a gift, if you want to use it for the devil, he'll let you. Because he's a man of his word. He made you in his image. And when he gives you a gift, he can't violate his own word and then take it away. So you can be saved. Ah, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost and still need some deliverance from mindsets. 
still need deliverance from some outward bodily things that are not in line with God's word. Because it's a process. Everyone say process. And I'm not teaching this morning on sanctification, but, but there's a word in the Bible. There's, there's the act of sanctification. It's the process of the Holy Spirit consecrating you and cleaning you out and setting you apart so that way your body and your soul have an opportunity to catch up to your spirit. That's why the Godhead is not hard to explain. I am one person with a mind, a body, a soul, and a spirit, and God is one person who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and we call him, we call him, we call him, it's, it's, it's not hard, it's not hard, it's a spiritual, everyone say salvation is spiritual, you can't earn it. All right, are we all, are we all okay? Amen. I need my timer back up here. Otherwise, I'll stay up here all day. 14 minutes, you'll live. It's okay. So number one, if you're taking notes, and I, I truly want to teach because I want to set the teach up for the preach and then set the preach up for the impartation. Are you ready? Number one, and I only have four points, so I've got... I've got a nice little Baptist sermon plus one, three points, and then my fourth is, is plus one. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of confrontation. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of confrontation. Everyone say confrontation. You cannot, oh, oh, wait. I forgot a scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. Quickly, please, that's on me, Sorry. 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. Therefore, so at the point of salvation, the Spirit of God joins together, actually overtakes our spirit, and now our spirit is one, is in complete unity with the Spirit of God. At that point, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. So we are now Christ's representation in the earth. We are now the representation of Jesus in the earth. That's why we're called the body of Christ. So the kingdom of God is a kingdom of confrontation. You cannot be an ambassador for the king unless you're willing to confront what is antagonizing your kingdom. And the truth of the matter is this, believers who can't confront satanic opposition, believers who are afraid of, of confrontation, it's because they're not secure in the authority that they have in, in Christ Jesus. Because Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 says that God has seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That word seated in the Greek word is a word that means he has appointed us. So he has taken me, appointed me in the heavenly courts to be a heavenly ambassador. I now have the same authority he has. That's why he said in Mark 16, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils. In my name, they will speak with new tongues. In my name, if they take up any deadly thing, it will not by any means harm them. In, in my name, these signs shall follow them that believe. Because they are an ambassador to the kingdom of God. Everyone say ambassador. I've got a, a list of a couple of things that ambassadors do. Number one, ambassadors represent the king wherever they go. Ambassadors are representatives of the, of, of the highest authority of the country that they come from. So if an, uh, if, if an ambassador to America, we've, we've been uh, to Manila and we've driven by the U.S. Embassy there. The ambassador from America who's, who's stationed at the U.S. Embassy in, 
in the Philippines, he's, he's in the Philippines, but when he's there as an ambassador, he's not under the authority of the Filipino president. He's under the authority, and God help him, of the president of the United States because he's an ambassador. Are you with me? Ambassadors know the heart of their king. Ambassadors speak for their king. I feel it getting a little tense now. Ambassadors speak on behalf of the king. But more importantly than all of those three, ambassadors carry the burden of the king. So that means the things that are important to the king have to be important to the ambassador. The things that bother the king have to bother the, oh, I feel, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. The things that, that irritate the king have to irritate the ambassador. The things that the king loves, the ambassador has to love. The things that the king cares about, the ambassador has to care about. The things that the king stays up at night thinking about, the ambassador has to stay up at night thinking about. So I'm I'm concerned why we've got a lot of churches in America who seem to have priorities that don't align with the kingdom of God. Because how, how can you call yourself an ambassador when what you stand for is in complete opposition of what's close to the heart of the king? And we have adopted this sissified, limp-wristed culture that doesn't want to offend anybody because I'd rather you like me than you listen to what I say. And I don't give a flying flip whether you like me or not. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to preach the word of God in season and out of season. I'm not here to make you feel comfortable. I'm here to preach the word in season and out of season. I'm not here to placate to what your flesh desires. I'm here because I've got a mandate from the king. Everybody say, I've got a mandate for conflict. The, the name Amos, the prophet Amos, his book is considered one of the minor prophets. But when you belong to the kingdom, there's nothing minor about the prophetic. Because it's not the pastor who walks into an atmosphere and shifts the demonic forces. The pastor can if the pastor is prophetic. And thank God our pastor is prophetic. And I don't have time to dive into to a teaching on the fivefold ministry, but... But, but I'll just say this for what it's worth. Be very careful of any group of people who, who, who hate church order and church government. Because when you go against the... the you, oh, help me. When you go against the order of God, the structure that God has laid out for your spiritual accountability, you are in rebellion and you may speak in tongues, but you're, but you're still a witch. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And it's rooted in the spirit of Jezebel because it, 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 it's, it's power and control. And Jezebel is not a female spirit. In the words of Bishop Kevin Wallace, God bless him, I've met a lot of three-piece suit wearing, clean-shaven, clean haircut preaching men who had the spirit of Jezebel. Because the Jezebel spirit is a controlling, manipulative spirit that runs away from authority and accountability. So the, the name Amos literally means he is a burden bearer. See, when God names you, your name becomes your identity. 
And no matter what you feel like doing, you can never truly get away from who you are. Because guess who's there when you wake up in the morning? Guess who's looking back at you when you wipe the, wipe the sleep out of your eye and brush your teeth in the morning and comb your pretty little hair? You've got to come to grips with who God told you you were supposed to be. So Amos means burdensome. It means he's a man that bears burdens. You can only bear a, a heavy burden with a strong foundation. Everybody say mandate. Say planted. Say immovable. People who bear burdens are, are, are mandated by God to do what they're doing. You want to know the secret to longevity? The secret to longevity is being planted. The secret to longevity is refusing to move from where God planted you. And oftentimes there's a lot of people who like to run from accountability behind the phrase, oh brother, God is just calling us into a new season. No, you're a liar. If you don't repent, you'll bust tail wide open and you're in rebellion because how can God call you somewhere else when you never were obedient the first place? So in response... Chapter 7 of the book of Amos, that's my main text, chapter number 7. The first six chapters, the Lord has, has, has uttered his judgments against the surrounding nations of Israel for their, their antagonization of Israel. And then he turned his focus outward and he focused inward upon Israel. And he gave them time after time after time after time after time to repent. And Israel refused to stop sacrificing their children to Molech. Israel stopped. They were in, in complete rebellion. They refused to stop mixing the Israelite form of worship with the Baal form of worship. And so Amos carries the prophetic word of God and, and issues a decree of judgment. Because most of the time, and, and, and here's the problem, we got a lot of people who want to be, who, who, who want to be prophetic, but they don't have a backbone. Because most of the time when God calls you to be prophetic, he calls you to be confrontational. And we want, oh, help me, Jesus. Help me. because, And we just want to grab a mic and start calling out people's names and phone numbers and credit card numbers and bank accounts under the anointing of the word of knowledge. I don't need a prophet to, to, to call my name. I already know my name. I already know my name. I know my date of birth. I know that I don't have enough money in my bank account. I know all these. Inf no, a true prophetic voice says what God tells them to say. And so in the first two judgments, chapter seven, verse one, Amos says, the Lord God showed me and behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop began to sprout and behold the spring crop was after the king's mowing and it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said Lord God please pardon how can Jacob stand for he is small the Lord God changed his mind about this it shall not be says the Lord so twice the Lord issues a judgment against Israel and twice a prophet steps in the gap and intercedes on behalf of his nation and spares the nation from judgment. But the third time is not so. The third time is not so. The prophet pleads for mercy upon the nation. And in verse number seven, thus he showed me and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will spare them no longer, and the high places of Isaac will be completely desolated, and, and the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. 
then I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Do you think that that was comfortable for Amos to say? You think that was the easiest thing for Amos to say? To approach a nation that all they want to hear is the blessing and the prosperity of God and he comes with a message of judgment? There's nothing peaceable about that. Where's the scripture? Pursue peace with all men. You can't make peace with sinners. You can preach the truth in love. But love is not synonymous with acceptance. Oh, I feel it getting heavy now. Lighten up, lighten up, lighten up. Just elbow somebody next to you. Make sure they're still breathing. Make sure they're still awake. Tell them, take your meds if you need them. Stay awake. Stay awake. Verse number 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all of his words. See, what's, what's interesting about this is that this is the spirit of accusation on full display. And the spirit of accusation always attacks God's people to distract from what they're not confronting themselves. And here is the reality. And this is my second point out of four. We're almost there. We're halfway there. Don't worry about it. Half, halfway there. We're going fast. Truth does not get you celebrated. Oh, I feel like preaching. Philip, I feel like preaching. Truth does not get you a gold medal. Truth doesn't get you on TBN. And God bless TBN. God love all of them. I love everybody in the kingdom of God. If you love Jesus, I love you. And, and even if you hate Jesus, I still love you. But I love you too much not to tell you the truth. And truth does not get a medal placed around your neck and a pat on the back saying, you're such a good little Christian boy. Thank you for telling me that I'm in sin. Thank you for telling me that I'm not allowed to sleep with my, my girlfriend outside of marriage. Thank you for telling me it's wrong to mutilate the genitalia of my six-year-old and try to make my six-year-old Johnny a six-year-old Joanna. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that what I'm, that the way I'm living is not right with the, the word of God. That's not what truth gets you. Truth gets you thrown in prison. Truth gets you crucified upside down and dipped in a pot of boiling oil like the apostle Peter. Or was it Paul? Which one was it? It was one of the peas, one of them. John, okay, John was dipped in oil. Sorry, I'm not perfect. John was dipped in oil. Truth gets you beheaded. Ask John the Baptist. And what's, what is so interesting about John the Baptist is this, is he is regarded as one of the most accurate prophets of his generation. He was the prophet who was said to have come in the spirit and power of Elijah. He was the Elijah of his day, and he never called out one person's name. He never, oh my God, I'm about to preach. He never prophesied one mansion. He never prophesied one car. He never prophesied prophesied one debt cancellation he never prophesied what people wanted to hear he simply said repent 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 for the kingdom of God is at hand and my God to heaven that we would get back to preaching repent the kingdom of God is at hand repent it's a sin for a man to marry a man it's a sin for a woman to marry it's a sin for a teacher to try to push sexual idolatries on a child it's a sin give me more monitor please I need more monitor it's a sin 
It's a sin. And I love you too much not to tell you. I'm not concerned with whether you like me. I'm concerned with whether God likes me. And that is the power that's perfect. That is the power of the prophetic. That is the power of the prophetic. (laughs) Truth doesn't get you celebrated. Truth doesn't get you celebrated. Truth gets your head chopped off by Jezebel. Because that's what happened to John the Baptist. Did you know that? King Herod married his brother's wife and then took her daughter who was 12 years old and let, let, oh help me God, let her 12 year old daughter strip for him and please him with a sexual dance on his birthday and John said, you're wrong. You're in sin. And what's hilarious is that Herod actually liked John. Herod loved John. But that's the thing about the the spirit of the age is they love you, Misty, as long as you have something to offer them. But the moment you confront the, stand up, lift your hands. I feel this all over you. Someone get behind her. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. I prophesy to you in the name of Jesus, there's coming a time in your life. Don't let her fall. Hold her up. There's coming a time in your life. God has you at a fork in the road. God has you at a crossroads. And you're about to step in rooms where you've got to confront spirits that you once used to operate with. God is, 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 is about to position you in the days to come to confront spirits that you used to fellowship with and the word of the Lord is it's not going to be easy but it will be worth it because the mandate that I've placed on your shoulders is a mandate of confrontation (sighs) receive it truth does not get you truth doesn't get you in the Forbes magazine truth won't even fill your church You want to know why? You want to know why? Oh, God. Oh, God, help me. Oh, that the, that the fear of the Lord would come upon us once again. Once again. That the fear of the Lord would come upon us in a way that we stop accepting what we should be casting out. You can love people until you're blue in the face, but love does not equal acceptance. Love does not equal acceptance. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, the prophet Jeremiah said, It's like fire shut up in my bones. I tried to hold it in and it was killing me. I tried to contain it and it was killing me. Because they tried to get Jeremiah to stop prophesying. They tried to get Jeremiah to stop preaching. But he said, I can't do it. I cannot be quiet. You thought I talked a lot when I was in school. I cannot be quiet. This got me a lot of lunch detentions and a lot of late slips, but I cannot be quiet because God has placed something on the inside of me. And if I don't let it out, it's going to kill me. See, truth has no off switch. And truth is almost always countercultural. It's in case you're having any amount of trouble discerning. In case you lack the spirit of discerning, the gift of discerning of spirits, this is all you have to do, okay? Turn on the news, and whatever they're saying, truth is probably the opposite. Yes, even Fox News. We've got to get back. I feel, oh, I feel the fear of God. We have got to get back to this. 
why are you crying about them taking the Bible out of schools? You won't even come to Bible study. Pastor calls 30 days of prayer and fasting. I saw you... I just need to look back here. Pastor calls 30 days of prayer and fasting. I only saw you one time. So you clearly don't really love prayer that much. You just want other people to love it for you. Truth. Truth is a person. Truth is not an ideology. Truth. Me and Philip worked with a girl one time. God bless her heart. I, she was honestly hilarious, and she was a great woman. God love her to death. But she said one time, she said the Holy Spirit was, was a feeling. The Holy Spirit has an effect of feeling, but the Holy Spirit is not a feeling. He's not a vibe. He's not a vibe because the danger in adopting that ideology is that if I don't feel him, I won't seek him. And we have, oh, Jesus Christ, I love you. We have nurtured, we have babied a soft generation of Christians and told them, it's okay, just do what you feel. Just, just be what you feel. It's okay, Herod. Let that 12-year-old strip for you. It's okay, school teachers. Let's have International Drag Queen Day for our fourth graders. Is this Chinese to anybody? Because I promise you, there is coming a day in America and you hear me by the Spirit of God. All you Trump lovers, that's fine. I voted for him twice and I'd still vote for him again. But Trump is not the answer for America. Trump is not the answer for the United States of America. Jesus is the answer. And there is coming a day where this kind of preaching will land you in handcuffs, not at the White House. I'm not here for popularity. I'm here because a man of God saw something in me that I didn't see myself, laid his hands on me, and through the impartation of the fire of God, put something in my spirit that God said, you're going to preach it whether you like it or not. Whether I have to send you by boat or send you by a... send you by the belly of a whale, I'm going to get my prophet to Nineveh. This limp-wristed, sissified culture. Afraid to tell anybody the truth. Afraid to call a demon a demon. Yeah, you might be saved, but you need to let the Holy Spirit change you. Yes, Spencer, you speak with tongues, but when you get mad, the way you speak to your family isn't acceptable. You need to let the Holy Spirit change you. And we want to be touched and coddled and rocked and comforted. And God is saying to hell with your comfort. I'm not interested in your comfort because if I was interested in your comfort, why don't you go ask the underground church in Iran if I'm interested in comfort? Why don't you ask the martyrs? Why don't you ask the apostles? Why don't you ask the ones who laid down their life for the sake of the gospel? Why don't you ask the people that lost their head for the preaching of the gospel? Why don't you ask the believers in communist China if I care about comfort? Is any of this making sense? I need, I need to hurry. I need to hurry. I'm not even anywhere close. 
to being done. Listen, listen, listen. I've got two more points. Is that okay? I've got two more points. And I'm not even going to, I don't even know why I do notes. I've got two more points. Your commitment to your calling, listen to this. Your commitment to your calling is tested when you're propositioned for silence. Ah. Your, your, <laughs> your commitment to God will be tested when they proposition you for your silence. Because that's what they did to Amos. Then uh, uh, verse 10, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam saying, Amos has conspired against you. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 11, thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Then Amaziah said to Amos, go you seer. Get out of here, prophet. I liked it better when you were prophesying debt-free homes. I liked it better when you were prophesying health, wealth, and prosperity. That's what I want to hear. Get out of here, Amos. Flee away to the land of Judah. There you can eat bread. There you can make a living there in Judah. We'll feed you in Judah. Ah, Shabbat so. We'll feed you in Judah. You can prophesy till the, till the paint comes off the wall. You can do it in Judah, but don't do it here. Don't do it here, Amos. And there you can do your prophesying, but no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is a sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. I'm too fat to be preaching like this. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful that no one said amen. Because people, listen, hear me, especially all of the preachers, we have got to grasp this. People will reject your gift the moment it stops benefiting them. Because the kingdom of God is filled with a bunch of leeches. Not just in America. Filled with a bunch of lazy, entitled Christians wearing spiritual pampers. That want the pastor to clean up their mess. Are you that... And I don't want to be offensive, so hear me by the Spirit, please. Are you that spiritually disabled that you've got to have someone do everything for you? Do you want to know one of the hardest things to do in ministry is lead worship? Because you lead worship to a group of people who say they love God, but then trying to cultivate a move of God, you go from being a worship leader to a flipping cheerleader. Why do I have to prime you and pump you to lift your hands? Has God done nothing for you that you need? Uh, because we want everybody else to have it. Because if they have it, I can hide behind them. One of the first times I ever saw a person possessed by a demon, I was in Argentina. I just started my preaching ministry. I was a punk. I didn't know anything. I still don't know anything. I'm, I'm still a punk. But I was, just for lack of a better term, I was a jit. As, 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 as the kids say, jit just means like lame, okay? I, I was a poser. And one of the things that the Lord spoke to me, he said, I'll, I'll start to move in power in your preaching ministry when you spend more time preparing than primping. Because there was a day, Misty, there was a day, Shanna, there was a day, Zach, 
where I spent more time searching for an outfit than prayer and fasting. Can I just be honest with you? And I love clothes. This is a brand new outfit. My wife bought me this. She said, honey, honey, let's stop by Target on the way home. And it was a trap. She didn't want, she wasn't going there for me. But she knew if she told me I could get a new preaching outfit that I'd pull the car into Target. And what did I do? I took it. And we got some new bowls and plates. Hallelujah. And I'm wearing new cargo pants and a new shirt that I'm too fat to button. So she said, wear it with this, wear it with a t-shirt underneath. So that's what I did. Because anointed women know how to dress their men. <laughs> but the Lord spoke to me and said, I'll begin to move in power when you spend more time praying than primping. And I'll let anybody who wants to, I, I'm, I'm, this is not about me, I'm just giving you a drastic example. I don't think anyone in here could preach from my notes because they're not notes. It's like chicken scratch. Like you would look at my notes and think I'm mentally not okay. Because I had to get to a place where, yes, I read Hebrew, I read Greek, I read commentaries, I study, I love the word. I love good preaching. I love good teaching. I love good preaching. I love when Philip preaches. I love when my wife preaches. I love when Colton preaches. I love when pastor preaches. I love listening to those guys in the Kojic church hoop and holler and, and grab their ear and, and, and tune up an A flat. I used to try to be one, but I can't do it. I can't do it. I'd try if there's an ordinance right now. But there came a point where, where the Lord said, I'll move in power if you'll straighten out your priorities. And so the first time that I ever saw, the first time that I ever saw a woman start to manifest was in Argentina. My dad would know the church I'm talking about. I was there with my dad and with Logan Tharp from Knoxville, Tennessee. And I was leading worship. And my dad got done preaching. And this woman with a baby walked through the back door. I don't even know where the heck she came from, but walked through the back doors. I did not know a body could move the way her body was moving. And I wasn't looking lustfully. I was looking because it, 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 it looked painful. I didn't know that, that joints and bones could bend backwards. I didn't know someone could just foam at the mouth because it was a demon. She was manifesting a demon. And for those of you who all you've ever seen is religious devils because there is such a thing, just go to a third world country where there's voodoo and witchcraft and uh, in Spanish it's called, uh, uh, yes, thank you, brujedia, and they cut chickens off and they do stuff with blood. And do and, and you know what I did? Me and Logan were hiding behind the drum set uh, seeing which one was going to cast it out because it wasn't going to be me. Because I was a poser. I had a, I had a form of godliness with no power. No power. And I would rather listen to a, a man or a woman of God with one tooth in their head that moves in power. That moves in supernatural power. Then listen to someone with four PhDs, brilliant Bible teacher, but no power. And don't take me out of context. I know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. I honor anyone who teaches and preaches and communicates the word of God. And you should too. Amen. You should never ask who's you should never ask who's speaking as a prerequisite to if to if you'll be there. That's demonic. It's a nasty spirit. Because either the word is enough or it's not. So Amaziah said, we don't want you here. And in fact, we'll pay your way to go prophesy somewhere else. Stand to your feet, I'm closing. 
We will pay your way. I feel the awe and reverence just come to the keyboard and just flow prophetically, whatever you want to do. I feel the awe and reverence of God filling the room. And Amos said, verse number 14, then Amos replied to Amaziah, I'm not a prophet. Being a prophet was never on my five-year plan. I didn't go to prophet school. I didn't try to connive and sneak my way into green rooms. And can I tell you the truth? Most people hate the gift on your life because they wish they had it. And you got something so effortlessly that with all the manipulation in the world, they could never receive and it has nothing to do with you being better. It has everything to do with you having the grace of God on your life. Because when you walk in the anointing, you just walk with God before you, goodness and mercy behind you. Go to something minor. And you walk completely surrounded by the presence of God. And doors just open because you made up in your mind, I have a mandate from heaven. And if you want me gone, you're going to have to kill me. You're going to have to kill me to get me out of this place. So Amos said, I wasn't even a prophet. Just leave it up there. Verse 15. I won't go any further than 15. I promise that's my binding word. Hope I'm not lying. Sorry, 14, go back. Thank you. I'm not a prophet. I'm not even the son of a prophet. For I'm a herdsman. I'm a shepherd. I'm used to herding animals, not hurting, herding. I'm used to herding animals. I know how to get my hands dirty. I'm just a grower of sycamore trees. And those type of trees were only grown and eaten by those of the lowest class of financial society. The poorest of the poor. So what is Amos saying? I didn't buy this anointing. I didn't. I didn't sow a seed with a guarantee from a TV charlatan that I was going to reap something that the word never promised me to have. I didn't buy this. See, you can't buy anointing. I didn't buy this. The answer is in verse 15. But the Lord took me. I don't want to cause any trauma. I cancel the spirit of, of replay for what I'm about to say. But it needs to be said. That word in the Hebrew is the same word as rape. It's the same word used in Genesis 34. And for time's sake, I'm not going to go read it. But in Genesis 34, go read about it. It's the same Hebrew word. The Lord took me against my will. I didn't have a choice but to prophesy. I didn't have a choice. The Lord took me and snatched me out of my daily responsibilities and placed me where I'm at so that I could, re I could deliver the word of the Lord. Because when you work for God, it's not a contracting business. You don't make your own schedule. 
God is your boss. God is your boss. If you, if you can remember at the beginning, I read Hebrews 4 and 12. Put that back up. The word of God. Do not tell me that the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of confrontation. Because where God is taking this house, he's calling this people to take a stand and to operate in confrontation because the word of God is a living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces, it divides that which is soulish from that which is spiritual. It divides joints and marrow and it pierces to the heart and it cuts it cuts the heart so what I'm going to do right now with every, every eye closed every head bowed the Lord told me to do this last Monday as I was flying home from Dallas I believe there's going to be an impartation and I'm not going to beg you to come but I want our ministry team Philip specifically if you'll help me on the count of three I'm calling you out of passivity no longer will you be passive Sebastian help me catch uh, O'Shea just stand behind people just move with us no longer will God accept a passive attitude God is calling you out from the shadows to the front line of confrontation because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of confrontation and when I lay my hands on you, when Philip lays his hands on you, when, when Genesis lays her hands on you, when Pastor Ken lays her hands on you when the ministry team lays their hands on you I command that timid spirit to come off of you and you are being called out for confrontation and if you need a Bible study later on how to speak the truth in love we'll also do that because truth needs to be spoken in love but I don't have all day so one two three if that's you if that's you just come line up on the front just come line up on the front and when you get here just lift your hands and worship when you get here just lift your hands and worship He's going to play and sing something, whatever he wants to do. And the Spirit of God is going to touch you. The Spirit of God is going to touch you. The Spirit of God is going to touch you. Y'all can come up here if you want. Just start to move. Start to move. Come on. Come on. Every spirit of shyness, every timid spirit, lay hands on their head and impart it into them right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus.